The Spin Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spinoff with help from Callahan Innovation. Here's your host, Simon Bell. Today, we're talking action. The debate is over. It is just fact that increasing diversity of gender, background and age in the decision-making parts of organisations helps businesses do better. But still, as we've been exploring a lot lately, only one of the NZX top 50 listed companies is run by a woman and less than 20% of directors on listed boards are women. Still. So it is past the talking and into the action stages. One person driving action is Miranda Burden, CEO of Global Women. Her organisation has pulled together a One Day for Change conference happening on the 19th of September. It's a great way to celebrate Suffrage Day, to talk about the how of increasing diversity in organisations with a range of business leaders and heavy hitters, from CEOs of our biggest companies like Fonterra and Spark through to ex-Prime Minister Dame Jenny Shipley. They're not mucking about. Miranda Burden is an award-winning exporter who's built a career in agribusiness, is chair of one of the biggest mushroom-producing companies in Australasia, and has been the architect of the conference. Thank you for joining us today. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Simon. Hey, cool. So first up, let's have a look at um, at your career. How did you get into making things happen in the agribusiness sector? Well, um, I suppose I, I think of it as a primary sector and um, the areas I've worked in have been dairy, wine and obviously horticulture with mushrooms. Uh, and the side I've taken has been on the commercial side, so not involved obviously in the growing and production, but uh, closely linked as we look at the sales and marketing and management side. And I, lo- I suppose it's a sector I love, I like the people, I like the concept of being connected to the land. Um, it's very much part of New Zealand and New Zealand's economy. Um, and from a marketing sales side, it's the connection to the consumer. So whether we're selling in New Zealand or selling overseas, understanding the different cultures and the different customers, what drives the market and meeting those needs has always been a passion of mine. And so it really just brings together the different aspects that I enjoy. And it's, of course, it's food and wine and yeah. all those great things we love to participate in. T- tell me about being the, um, the exporter of, of the, the, the Export Award in 1999. A um, few years ago now, I, it derived from, I suppose, a strategy to grow our domestic business, uh, but the recognition that actually there was a huge opportunity from an external perspective as well, and we needed to balance the pace of growth in New Zealand with the opportunities offshore. So we took a very uh, carefully constructed approach to how we did that and identified a Japan in particular, uh, but also Australia uh, and other parts of Asia, Singapore, for example, and Hong and Hong Kong, and just developed the markets up there. Recognise the products that were going to sell the best, and work to understand the the consumer and the market and the demand, and put it all together to to succeed. That's so cool. And so, building those kind of markets overseas, you would have seen 
different business cultures, different business practices. Uh, and, you, you know, that, that idea of being in, in leadership in those positions, was that, was that always something that was of interest to you? Uh, I think I was lucky enough. I um, come from a family where my mother is English. Uh, we spent a fair bit of time with her family. I lived. I went on a, a field scholarship exchange when I was much younger. Lived in Italy, and I've always found the different cultures. Uh, it's such a profound difference coming from a different culture. It's something I've loved and enjoyed understanding. So export um, enables me to bring business, which I love, and people together. Um, and understanding different cultures. So working within those environments was challenging. Yeah, yeah, But it yeah. was really exciting. And, uh, you know, we made sure we didn't, we didn't try and sell ice to the Eskimos. We were very, very careful that we found products that were wanted and needed and applied them in those opportunities. I recently had to go back to Japan for a second time on a business development trip because the first time we got a whole bunch of yeses, but they didn't mean yes. Ooh. And so I had to go back... <laughs> I had to go back with someone who was a, a local uh, agent uh, to find out what yes meant, which wasn't actually um, necessarily yes. And and I think that's a common, you know, there's so many examples of even going into Australia, the challenges of going into Australia. Um, and at the time I was there, it was a very, um, well, for example, uh, the Australian market for produce was very tightly held cliques uh, and had a very interesting reputation so it was a big eye opener. Um, I was pretty young at the time. I worked incredibly hard uh, to stay on top of the game, make sure we were delivering value. Um, but I loved it. You know, it's it's easy to work really, really hard when you're passionate about something. What were these industries like? Uh, you, you know, we're looking at kind of agricultural and primary businesses. Were they very male? Were they very male when you were in them? Like, oh, comically so. I would turn up, um, and yeah, I. There's so many silly little stories. I would turn up and um, be confronted by the most astounding language. And it, you could almost see them staring at me, just trying to provoke a response. Um, I, making sure that we talked the same language, and which meant I didn't use any buzzwords. I stayed away from any jargon. Um, making sure that I was there at two in the morning or three in the morning when the markets opened as much as they were, that I knew how to grow the products and I had I was hands-on in the business so that I could talk to them in a way that they understood was really important. But um, I love the industry because anything related to growing is very people are very passionate about. The connection to the land uh, attracts a certain person, I think, and you have a great empathy for the... Um, vagaries of the climate and the impact it has on people's livelihoods and it's not a job you don't turn up and make widgets um this is something that you know goes to the bone and many of these industries have been in families for years and years you know far market farmers market gardeners uh tend to be family driven family owned family run mm. and as such they are they wear them on their sleeves wear their hearts on their sleeves and to earn the kind of trust and respect of people uh do you have to work kind of twice as hard coming from the outside and being a, a woman leader in these industries? I don't know that being a woman made a difference, yeah. actually. Um, do you have to work twice as hard? No, everyone works hard. I think the reality of business is it doesn't just come. You actually have to work really hard. Um, and if you want to succeed and lead, then that's not it's not chance. It's not luck. I always laugh when I hear about overnight successes. You dig a bit deeper, it's sort of seven years in the making yeah, yeah. and overnight that next year. So, um, yeah, I think success in business requires hard work and commitment. Yeah, Karen Walker, who we spoke to on this uh, podcast, she said that um, success for her business was like coral. She'd build on every little part and it would keep getting bigger the more yeah. parts that got built on, which was a really cool way to look at it. Exactly, and it's... Um, there's no silver bullet in most of these things. You know, there's a bit of luck, but luck comes to those who try. Uh, so when op luck is an opportunity taken in so many ways. It's so interesting you say that the language um, can be confronting in um, very kind of male atmospheres. I was on a course uh, the, the other week um, at, at a, um, a uni, and I would have thought it would have been an exec business school course. Oh. And there were some people from um, the construction industry who were using kind of language that seemed out of another era. So it's not it's not gone. Maybe I just live in too much of a urban liberal <laughs> bubble to, to see it very often. Well, you know, we adapt to our environment. Um, interestingly, most of the people who I got to know then I still know. 
um, from, uh, you know, we're talking the late 90s and many of them remain in the produce sector uh, and none of them would use really horrendous language now. It was very much a test and I, it was, I mean, it was a tiny example of just proving yourself, but I don't know if that was because I was female or just because I was new in the market. Um, I think I had a couple of people who were more senior commented on it to me um, in a very positive way. It never, it uh, didn't worry me. It was not done with malice. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's such an education piece. And um, you, you know, if you look at uh, a lot of these challenges and changing kind of diversity and inclusion, part of it does come back to just thinking about the environment that you make for other people, doesn't it? Oh, very much so. And I think. That, that's been one of the really interesting parts about this job. You know, one of the biggest challenges is what we don't know, mm. not what we do know. And um, a colleague of mine, um, a friend, Reese Valiafa, who runs Tupatoa at the moment, um, was talking about working with the willing. And I think it's a great concept that um, to create the kind of change that makes a really inclusive environment, we have to be really open-minded um, and recognize that doing the same thing that we've been doing all the time for many years worked really well for who we are but actually other people have come from a different environment and we have to change so we have to be willing to change and willing to challenge the way we do things and willing to think about every aspect including language you know how we invite people to things how we engage people how we enable them to talk it's a it's a really bad habit that we have in a western environment to be extremely extrovert and talk over people when we want to make a point and that is really culturally insensitive within a Maori um, environment. So all of these subtleties need to be comprehended. And, yeah, it's, a, it's thinking about the environment and a great willingness to try. That's a good point to jump into what you are doing at Global Women. And so how did you come to be at Global Women? Is it uh, much of a difference from the rest of your <laughs> career? Is it a different kind of uh, approach? Well, so I, uh, I took time out of executive roles um, when I had my third child. So I've been um, GM of global marketing at Perno. Um, I'd worked in a number of different um, businesses. And I had my third child and didn't want to spend as much time working and traveling. Um, so I was lucky enough to be able to step away from exec roles. I retained directorships at that stage uh, and did some consulting. Um, and over that time, I also spent a lot of time working in the community um, assisting at school, uh, but in particular with the sports clubs. And I think that was very easy. I was really lucky. I, I had great communities around me. I appreciated the community as a young mother and all the people I interacted with and saw a very easy way to give back by supporting them, bringing in my business experience um, to support the what they were doing. So the tennis clubs and working with uh, Auckland Tennis and the football club which was in a huge growth mode, but struggling to keep up. So in that capacity, I spent quite a lot of time with non-for-profit organizations. Uh, Project Lightfoot is another one, which I'm still a trustee of, um, who gives back to community, or essentially, it's a non-for-profit organization that teaches um, people about sustainability through sports champions and has to date saved about $6.5 million for sports clubs in New Zealand. All of those exposed me to the non-profit sector mm. and um, lots of different perspectives. So when I was approached about this, um, it's different at so many different levels from uh, the very commercial world of marketing and sales and general management, but it's all about business. So it brings together the social success, the economic success of New Zealand um, by including all the people and all the talent in New Zealand. And that's really what appealed to me. And, and by doing it, by pitching it in a very commercial way, uh, talking about uh, inclusivity and diversity as a driver of business success, not a, um, not a nice to have. Yeah, and, and that's a reality. You know, um, talking to, discussing this this morning with another colleague, um, good business is a business that's inclusive and takes part, ta uh, takes into consideration diverse perspectives, and that's proven a hundred times over. So there is just a storm of evidence coming in to say that diversity of thought will enable you to be more fleet-footed, uh, more agile, respond to the changing environment, uh, make better profit, avoid groupthink. 
So there's just a massive opportunity. But for New Zealand, it's really interesting. For New Zealand, we're grappling with this and huge societal change as we have population shifts with a far greater Asian population and a far greater um, Maori and Pacifica population who are also much younger. Mm. You know, in a few years' time, there'll be five generations working alongside each other in the workforce. There's so much change occurring in how we operate that we need to think about how we enable that to happen in an effective manner. And that's a huge opportunity for New Zealand. So in that respect, it's very similar to what I've been doing for a long time. Um, it brings in the commercial side for the, I suppose, societal benefits and the benefit of a country that I love. And let's look at this conference that you've pulled together, which sure. is very much about this idea of action, which I like. Because when yes. we've spoken to a lot of people and we, we hear the issues, we're told about the, the, the benefits, but as a country... We've actually slipped. I mean, for a while there, New Zealand was very happy with itself because it had the top four women uh, positions, the biggest company, the Supreme yep. Court, the Prime Minister. Uh, but now we're, we're slipping backwards again. Yeah, uh, I agree. And I, when I got approached about the role, I actually said, what's happened? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a real challenge for me to try and understand what has happened. Um, so... This, the summit, One Day for Change, came about because we keep getting asked the same questions. So there's a few sort of basic challenges when people think about how do we make our businesses more diverse? How do we engage with these younger populations, the ethnic populations, the different genders? Um, but they don't have the answers. So we work with amazing partners who are truly a coalition of the willing. They are the people who are leading the change uh, to a more inclusive New Zealand. Um, and want to see actually that change in the workforce being reflected throughout the workforce um, or change in the population reflected throughout the workforce, they have great stories to tell. You know, they have the battle wounds. There's no definitely no question there. No, this isn't all easy. Um, but they also have put in place plans, have worked really hard, they've made, taken lots of learnings, and so we brought that to the fore. We want to show people how because most people know why. Mm. They know it makes business sense. Um, in fact, it, it's bad business not to have a diverse group of uh, a set of talent. Mm. So you, you've, you've got some really big names, but um, maybe tell us about some of the people we might not have heard of that you've got speaking here before we get to the big names. Sure, I'd love to. I, I'm just so excited about this day because of who it brings together. So we have Aditi Pandit uh, works at Deloitte and the social and drives the social impact practice um, and has done amazing work, particularly looking at the millennial workforce. Also in that group is Anna Davis, who actually got the Young Financial Manager of the Year um, award at the CFO Awards last year. Uh, Guy uh, Ryan, who you may know, um, who's the CEO of Inspiring Stories. He just held a Festival for the Future, which was fascinating to be involved in. And um, they had 1,300 people. And the, I suppose the key theme that came through when I'm talking to all of these people is their focus on social impact um, and this strong sense of social responsibility and how a lot of what we're going to be talking about on um, the 19th of September is how that generation wants to actually be involved in driving social impact and how they see the organizations they work for can enable that. So they don't see diversity as a challenge. They just see it as a must-have, and they don't want to participate in organizations that aren't inclusive and aren't diverse. Um, Another panel that we have on the day is uh, looking at the Maori workforce, Um, and Tracy Hopapa is facilitating that one, um, and she is bringing a huge amount of experience um, to that panel, which is fantastic. We have a whole range of people uh, and different perspectives, including uh, Jason Walker, who's one of our champions for change and has been in the recruitment side of things for a long time, watching the change in trends. And I think he's got a really interesting perspective on the challenges the Maori workforce actually faces. Um, Kaha Brown from Fletcher's, um, who's the National People Performance Manager and has recently set up and been involved in a program specifically to build um, the Maori participation and leadership within Fletcher's, which has been incredibly successful and one of the few that actually exist in the market. So it's really exciting to see the progress that Fletcher's has been making at that level to drive a change in their f- workforce. Um, Paracafia, McLean, I could talk for hours about these guys. I mean, 
there, it's an amazing list of people who have contributed their time because they see the importance of these conversations and they'd like to see change happening faster. But they all bring different ways and means by which they have driven change or they have participated in creating change. So it's great. And so that, that's where the focus is on things you can pick up, yep. implement, run with, and see results from, as opposed this, to like a... You know the old joke of like the all male panel on diversity. Exactly, and then this, but it's a, so it's a really interesting point. So this whole day is about how, mm. how can you make change? How have these people made change? How can you apply those learnings to your business? And also, if you're thinking about it, um, whether because your customers are diverse or whether you think your organisation needs to change, um, what are what are the learnings that you can take out broader than a it's not about a. Um, uh, it's not about an HR strategy. It's about a strategic decision to do better as a business. So we're really trying to encourage um, organisations to actually participate from across their organisations. So there's a bit of a historic issue where this has been a people issue. Mm. It's much broader than that. Um, this is a business issue now. This is a, a, a you know the benefits of diversity impact the environment, the economic. Um, bottom line, they impact the social bottom line. So there's so many reasons that we actually need a broader audience here. In, in the spirit of the how, I mean, people should definitely be getting along if they're able to uh, on the 19th. But um, in, in this, in the spirit of the how, like if, if someone can't get along and they're interested and they're thinking, yeah, yep, I know, but what can I do? What, yep. what, what are some just like, this is something you could enact tomorrow to make a difference? In the spirit of the how, uh, we have, I suppose, on the day, we have um, a lot of the business leaders, some of whom you will have heard of before, the Simon Motors, Vicky Robertson, Teo, um, Sparings. But um, although they've published various things, it's not widely available anywhere. And there's no anticip- There's no plan. This is not a – we're not an event organizer. That's not what we do at this organization. So we don't have a mass distribution plan of the contents of the day. Um we do have newsletters, we will share blogs, we write up as much as we can. So I would direct people to the Global Women website where we have a lot of resources. Um, I'd encourage them to read the blogs where we keep all as many learnings as we can and share them. Um, and also we're in the process of working with Champions for Change, which is a collaboration of CEOs and um, other chairs who are about to launch a uh, flexibility toolkit, which will have a whole lot of tools that people can go into and utilize. Um, and we know flexibility drives diversity in organizations. That's proven. Uh, so that would be a great resource for people to lean on. Um, beyond that, I just say, come and listen. You know, this is the leaders that we have speaking on this day are amazing. So Ralph Norris, who is probably one of Australasia's best known leaders, um, will be interviewed, uh, it's not an opportunity we plan to repeat on a regular basis. We're just trying to make it as accessible as possible to drive a change as fast as we can. Mm. I'm impatient. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and one of, I mean, some of these measures are so stubborn, like the pay gap, which, oh. um, is, is, you know, it's been 40 years since the Equal Pay Act, and still we have, um, you know, at the very least, a, a 10% gap in pay. And something that you guys have been publicizing that I found really interesting was that a lot of the pay gap actually exists at the top levels. So yeah. there was an example that your organization had, had put out about um, accounting partners, the men on average earning 50000 more than the women for the same role, which is extraordinary. And and it's it, all we're doing is sharing research. So um, it's proven that at the upper end of the tiers, the um, management tiers, the gap gets wider, doesn't get more narrow. I think the pay gap is incredibly complicated uh, and the advice we would give to anyone is you need to be really analytical and look hard in your organization. It's not a generic once over. Um, If you haven't asked the question, do we have one and done the analysis, you won't know. Assume that you do have one because most organizations we know have found they do. Well, I I would have thought if any profession was going to understand number discrepancies, it would be accounting and that the partners just wouldn't be wouldn't be having it but people haven't compared it so it's not necessarily that they don't understand it and it's not that it the issue isn't uh, understanding it's actually recognition so 
Uh, one of the things the Champions for Change committed to this year was reporting on their gender and ethnic representation across their organisations. Now that's important so that they can see how they're progressing because until you actually track it, you don't know what's happening. And the same thing applies to pay gap. Unless people have actually and actively dug into it in their organisation, there isn't a generic answer and most people won't know it's there. So, so it's a famous response that comes through over and over, oh, we don't have one. Yeah. Well, how do you know? Well, and, and that's the old um, business idea, isn't it? That you get what you measure. So exactly. obviously these measures, these things aren't being measured. They haven't been in the past. They are increasingly. And the UK is introducing a requirement to track your pay gap. Um, Australia has legislation in place. Uh, New Zealand has been, do, has been tracking, um, particularly in the public sector. Uh, so it's now recognised as an issue. Uh, there's a bit of an um, uh, exponential curve here as we look at the speed at which these things come into reality and then drive change. And I think what we're seeing now is that we're getting the critical mass and the momentum where actually ever it's coming to the front of all conversations. Yeah, well, and, and I think that this uh, conference that you put together could be seen as one of those kind of um, pivot moments because obviously the, the standard of people you've got coming along are very big names and not just there for window dressing either. I find it really interesting mm -hmm. that um, Simon M Moto out of um, Spark, uh, his comments saying that, you know, they're a work in progress and that's, that's cool. They're coming not saying we're doing it right. They're coming saying we're doing the work. Oh, uh I endorse everything you say there. I have huge respect for Simon, uh, not least because he recognises what isn't working and he's very upfront about it. And uh, I know from comments earlier this week or discussion with him, he's planning to come and share the challenges um, and talk about some of the things that haven't worked um, because it's not super easy, you know, and change isn't, you know, when you do things, the trick is to um, learn. And I think that's something that Simon and Spark have worked really hard on. Um, and that's the point, I suppose, all of these people have been asked to provide takeaways for people, what can they do? Uh, but I agree, I, I think we're at the p tipping point or the pivot point, we are getting very close to it. And the power and influence of women is being demonstrated amazingly when you're looking at the sort of voting numbers that are coming through with um, uh, Jacinda Ardern at the moment and the impact that people making a choice has made. And, and actually, uh, Sam Stubbs and Simplicity, the campaign they have at the moment around driving diversity, they're telling people to, to act with their feet. Mm. You know, So now's the time to walk the talk. We've had a lot of talk, um, and we'd just like to provide tools to help people do that. Oh, I can't, can't wait until it's not the biggest issue that's currently <laughs> facing business uh, at the moment. Well, thank you so much for uh, your time. That's wonderful. It's Miranda Burden, who is the CEO of Global Women New Zealand. Uh, the conference is called One Day for Change. It's on the 19th of September. And if you're listening to this after the chance to be able to go and see it, head to their website where you'll be able to find all of the, uh, the action points out of the day because it's about the how. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Jose Barbosa, for producing, and thank you very much for listening. If you're still here, maybe you'd uh, be able to do us a solid and head on to iTunes and like and subscribe. Cheers. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.